Um, yeah, so my talk is called Making Compassion Easier. It's kind of like a strange title, but I hope it will, uh, the, the talk will explain what this is about. And it's, it's a particular, Sebastian talked about strategy, I'm also talking about strategy, but I'm talking maybe a bit more specifically about uh, one particular strategy. Um, I'm just going to explain what I think is a good strategy. Um, uh, yeah, if you want, I can send the slides. Yeah. Um, if you don't give them to the meat industry, because um, <laughs> this is top secret. Um, so what I'll do, I'll just uh, give an intro on, on strategy, uh, well, a general intro of something on strategy, then some strategic departing points, like things that I think are very general when we think about, very important and very general when we think about our movement, and then strategy itself. Um, so before we start, some things. Um, there's no need to, to, for you to agree on anything I say. I ex in fact, I expect you to disagree with some things, unless you are very intelligent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, generally, I'm, I'm seeing basically some things now and then that, that people really disagree with or that, that they haven't thought about and that are different from what they used to. Uh, I think it's important when we discuss like different strategies and different approaches and different actions that we don't criticize, but we like depart from the idea that we have all the same great intentions, right? So this person may do something else than this, than, than this person, but let's not say like this person is like stupid or that he's like not caring about the animals or he's caring just about his ego. They just have different tactics and different ideas about what works, right? I see so much criticism towards each other in the movement, like people saying like they're in it like to get members or they're in it like for this or whatever, for their ego or something like that. Let's just assume, it's not always true, but let's assume that they're in it for the right reasons to save animals, okay? So I think there are good and bad strategies, or good and better strategies, or bad and worse strategies. I think it's not useful to say like, oh, we need a bit of everything. You know, you, you hear that a lot of times when we're discussing and somebody is always going to say like, we need everything. You know, everything is good and everything contributes, etc. I don't think that's necessarily true because um, we have limited time and limited money and so we have to look for the best ways to do things. And a good, a, a, when you assess a strategy, when you assess an action, it's not just a matter of like how many people are you turning on, but also how many people are you turning off from our movement, right? So if I, if I send out like, uh, suppose like, let's say like a very horrible animal cruelty video doesn't work. It will work for two, three people for instance, but it may at the same time turn, alienate a lot more people from veganism. Like they say, like, oh, this is not for me and I can't see this and, and, and they're, they're just gone and we've lost them for a while at least, right? So we have to always think of like, not just the people we turn on, but also the ones we turn off. And I think one good way to think about like the ideal strategy is like, suppose I give you, I tell you, you're the, you're the director of your own vegetarian organization and I give you as a, as a very big uh, wealthy person, I give you, um, let's say, uh, five million euros to do a, a campaign on TV, right? That's the way I think in, in, about strategy. Like, what message would you bring them if you have five million dollars or whatever to uh, put a commercial on TV? Would it be like a go vegan message? Would it be like a vegan is healthy message? Would it be like a um, meat is murder message? You know, what kind of message would you bring them? That's the way I try to think about Like, what can reach the most amount of people and turn the most people over? Okay, that said, I mean, what I'm going to present is just one strategy and there's, I think it's, it's something that needs to be done, but on this, at the same time there can be other interesting strategies, okay? And very importantly, which strategy, which actions to use, which ideology to have, which like, way of communicating to have is very much a matter of time. And I mean time in the history of our movement, right? Um, today we, today certain things are not that effective, which could be much more effective in 10 years, right? For instance, I don't think um, um, like shouting in the street like meat is murder, etc., and like being very confrontational is very useful at this moment, but it may very well be in the future when there's a lot more public support for what we do, right? You can see that, I think Sebastian said it, um, I mean, if we, if we have a uh, demonstration against fur, it has a lot more public backing than if we protest against meat, because so many, people eat, eat, so many more people eat meat. So we have to take that into account. So take time in the history of our movement into account. So, yes, sorry. I will 
Uh, I can give you the slides, yeah. It's a, like a big file, though, but uh, yeah. You can. Um, some objectives I have for you for this workshop. Um, these are um, points that I, I, I hope you see afterwards, or I hope you can think about at least afterwards. I don't think we, we should uh, focus all the time on trying to veganize people, trying to like, have the, like, the go vegan message. I'll explain why. I don't even think we need to focus on animal rights all the time. And um, yeah, that's, that's what I already said. Uh, I think what is efficient, what is not efficient, is very much uh, uh, dependent on the time and the history of our movement. Okay? So, very briefly about uh, our organization, EVA, Ethical Vegetarian <laughs> Alternative. Um, we are uh, about uh, 12 people and two dogs. Um, <laughs> their uh, their um, security and food inspection. Um, <laughs> that's their task. Um, we, um, this, is our, this is the way we phrase our mission. Eva, Eva aims at the maximum production and consumption of plant foods, replacing animal foods, in order to contribute to a healthier, greener, and more animal-friendly society. You can see maximum production is very strategically chosen. If you say we aim for a vegan world, for politicians and whatever, they say like, oh, these are the crazies, right? Um, so a maximum production is, we mean, of course, like complete zero, zero uh, meat production, zero animal products production. But uh, we say maximum production because it's much more um, palatable for people. Um, and we emphasize not just um, animal friendly, but also healthier and greener for strategic reasons, because a lot of people can, can dig into that, can buy that much more easily than they, 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 they can understand the animal costs. We are the only, um, vegetarian or animal rights even organization in the world that gets substantial amount of money from the government. So we get 165,000 euros a year right now. We have had this for 15 years more or less. Every year we get this. So, um, so I'm just using it as an illustration to show that we were apparently able somehow to show the government that we are, that we are socially relevant. That what we are doing is relevant. If you're not an animal rights organization, you cannot prove that to them. You understand? They, they don't care enough about animal rights right now to give you money for that. Just a little maybe, but not this amount. They care about, about um, environment and about, um, about health. That's the two things they care about. If you can show that like, it's a whole story of environment, of health, of animal rights, of the world hunger problem, of poverty, of whatever, all these things together, that becomes a, a story that's today politically relevant. But just the animal rights story is not yet politically relevant enough. It will be. So to answer your question why, there was just um, an opportunity, like the cultural department in our government, the adult education it's called, uh, they um, said like we're going to reshape, reform the whole subsidy policy and they said like organizations who have been active in this field for more than two years and have a national working, they can submit a business plan and the best we will honor with subsidies. And so we submitted the business plan and we got the subsidies and we are like safe for even more, 10, year, 10 more years. And this is uh, just this is a fourth of our budget. Yeah. Is this uh, Belgium? This is Belgium. What kind of Belgium you get money from? Yeah, it's actually Flanders. If you know Belgium, we have a Dutch-speaking part, Flanders, and a Walloon, a French-speaking part. Okay, it's their own government there. Yeah, they have the, they, it's a very complicated and messy country. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't even understand it myself. <laughs> uh, but it's from the Flemish government that we get it. There's also a federal government. Um, so we have 12 paid staff members with that. Um, our fam most famous campaign you may have heard of is the Veggie Day campaign. Is like we were the first city in the world that actually declared that Thursday, that that one week in in, in uh, one day a week is the Veggie Day. Is like uh, officially it's like officially supported by the city. We have seven or eight cities in Belgium who officially support the Veggie Day campaign, right? And I will also explain why this Veggie Day, this like meat reduction idea, is I think a good idea. So on strategy, um, what we I think, I mean, there's different ways to describe our goal, but I would say like we want to abolish animal um, suffering and animal killing. You have to pay attention to the fact that it's like only human caused uh, um, animal suffering. Killing. We're not caring at this moment about wild animal suffering. I think that's a very interesting thought and I think we should care about that too, but maybe it's for later. Uh, but, but basically we want to stop uh, the killing and the, the, the use of animals by people. So a strategy is just a plan to achieve our goal as quickly and efficiently as possible, right? Every, every month we lose, there's a lot more animals killed and hurt. Um, and we are trying to do the, uh, if we are being strategic, we try to do the most good we can do to reach that goal, right? Sebastian will talk to you more about effective altruism. 
um, factory of altruism is about like thinking like what is the best way what is the is getting me uh, the most lives saved and the, and, and the most harm reduced etc I put or not because we can we don't always want to make the decision to go for the for the really um, like I give you an example my my girlfriend works at my organization also but she also also has like a kind of like a cat shelter and um, well we, we we put cats out uh, for, for to be adopted and uh, there was a, a rich woman who said like I give you five hundred thousand uh, euros if you um, if you can make me a good business plan and if I'm convinced to give that money to you and. Um, uh, my girlfriend said, "Like, like, yeah, okay, I want to, I want to, I want to write this business plan." But, 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 and of course, that was very effective to write a business plan so that she could get the money. But she was, she, she, her heart is in, in, in caring for those cats physically, like you know, like, like helping them and like. Um, I mean, we always have twenty cats at her home, and uh, and that's what she wants to do. She doesn't want to write stuff. She does that already at work, and she does this cat stuff to to be with the cats. Right? It's not the most effective thing, but sometimes it's where your heart is, it's also important to feed that, you know? So you don't always have to say, like, I have to go for the most, I mean, try to be strategic in your choices, but, but if you feel something is, is very close to you, very important to you, I think that's also a, a very important thing, uh, just against burnout even, you know? Like, if you, if you don't want to burn out, you have to do things that you like and that where your heart is in, okay? Um, good. Um, so, about strategy, do you know this quote? Yeah, yes. So the question is not, can they reason nor can they talk, but can they suffer? This is a quote by Jeremy uh, Bantam. Um, so I made uh, my own variation on this quote. The question is not, am I right, nor is this true, but does it, this work, right? Um, I think it's very important to like, look at what works. That's what strategy and impact is all about for me. Like, look at what works, look at what actually, Melanie said yesterday, that the, the aim is to open minds, open hearts. Right? What opens hearts? What actually leads to uh, behavior change in the end? Right? It's not about like um, you know. There's so many people I hear like that. They say like they say something like, for instance, meat is murder, and then you say like, is this strategic to say this to people? And then they say like, I don't care if it's true, you know. And it's their truth, but their truth is not so important. I think. I mean, your truth is important for you, but it's not always important to like to like shout out your truth if if you know that truth is is not going to be good for the animals. So that's why I'm saying like, does it work is the most important question. Not if it's true or if you're right, you know? You can have these discussions and uh, like there's another person like you want to like convince them that you're right. But I mean, you know, in sales they say, winning an argument is losing a customer, right? If you, if you have a, an argument with a, your car salesman and, and, and you have an argument and, and you say like, um, the, the other person says, ah, this was uh, under warranty and you have to pay this and I as the car salesman say no. And in the end, I'm right and I have won the argument, but the customer is not coming back, right? That's the way it's, it's, it's also a lot with, with discussions, with arguments. If I have an argument with you and in the end, we, we, we feel that I've won the argument, I'm right. But you can be left with a very bad feeling about that, like a feeling of inferiority or a feeling of whatever. So it's not the best idea always to win arguments. It's, it's about winning itself. Winning is, is it's, it's not about winning arguments, it's about winning. And winning would be, in our case, that you, um, you go away from the discussion with, with a good feeling and with a feeling of, I, I'm open to this, I want to change, okay? All right, so strategic starting points. I'm going to go over them one by one. Uh, these are, so these are points that I think, if we, if we think of strategy in our movement, uh, these are very important uh, points that we could, there's more than this, I just uh, named five. First of all, our cause is different than other causes. It's not always comparable with slavery, with the women's right movement, with, um, with the children's right movement, etc. We, we, we are prone to compare. You know, we, we say like, oh, um, do you know this thing like, like, like for instance, Meatless Monday, um, you know, or, or, or Veggie Thursday, like once a week vegetarian. Some people will say like, oh, so it's okay to kill a person once a week. You know, um, or we cannot say like this is uh, we have a slavery free Monday and the rest is like is like okay to have slavery. This is not it's very smart. I think it's not comparable. It's not you cannot compare these issues, right? And these are some um, some uh, factors in which our movement differs from uh, the other uh, movements. The protesters are not our victims. Are not the victims, right? That's very clear. 
Okay. So the, we are the protesters, but we're not the victims of the movement. We may feel victimized sometimes by uh, meat-eating bullies or whatever, but we're not uh, the animals themselves. The animals cannot speak. Um, there's a high dependency on animal products. There's, I think if you compare, for instance, with the slavery movement, I don't think um, slavery or the society at that moment was ever so dependent on slavery as our society today is dependent on animal products. We eat three times a day, every day, and most people eat some kind of animal products in every meal, right? And then that, that's not taking into account animals in entertainment, animals in clothing. Animals are everywhere. So we are very much invested in animals. It means it's very hard to change that. It's, it has a huge investment. If you say to, to a person, go vegan, if he believes that he has to go vegan, he knows he has to change a lot, right? Okay. 95% uh, of the people are not on board yet. I think also with slavery, for instance, I think there were more people at, at, at a certain point, in the, even in the beginning of, the, of that um, um, period, who were actually not uh, in favor of slavery. In our case, a lot of people participate, almost all. It's a relatively young movement. It's about food, which is also very important. Food is, is something like very, very, that goes very, very deeply. It's addictive, almost, right? Okay, we are almost addicted to cheese or to meat and whatever, so it's, that's even harder to change anything else. It's very emotional also. And meat eating is an ancient thing. It's like something that has been in our species for like ages and ages and ages, right? millennia or, 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 or longer than that. So this all makes it very hard to change meat eating. Secondly, critical mass is priority. You, are you familiar with the concept of critical mass? Yeah, I'll explain in a minute. So there, there's several um, ways to, to answer this question, why do most people eat meat? My answer to this, why do most people eat meat, is most people eat meat because most people eat meat. Right, you understand? Um, has anybody of, of you seen this? I'll explain briefly. So there was this, um, this psychologist who, um, who did a test in the 60s or 50s or whatever, and he asked people like, which of the um, of the the bars on the right is just as long as the bar on the left, and then you all say what? A. a. Yeah, it's not a trick question. It's just a, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not like a visual uh, illusion thing. So uh, exhibit one is as long as a. So uh, but what the psychologist did was like in, in in a group, he put all kinds of people who were in the experiment together with him. They were conspirators, right? And he asked them to give a wrong answer. And if you had enough people before you giving a wrong answer, you would see that about 60% of the people also gave the wrong answer, right? They would say, so a lot of people in front of me say uh, B or C, and I would also say B or C because I'm, afraid, like I'm, I'm, I'm starting to go crazy. I'm thinking like, like what? Uh, and, like, and you're like thinking you're wrong, and you're thinking like, there's, there's a lot of group pressure. And it's not hard to see the parallel with, animal, with, with eating animals. Even if you think that there's something wrong with it, even if you think like, Oh, what are we doing? We're like eating these harmless, these innocent creatures, and, and like we're we're locking them in cages and we're mistreating them. But then you say like, oh, but 95% of the people are doing it. It can't be that wrong. It can't be that bad, right? So, for this reason, I think that critical mass, having as many people um, changing their diet, is very important. And then um, when we reach that, as soon as we reach that point, we will. That's a tipping point from where it will go a lot faster, right? There, is, there will be a point, I'm, I can't say when it is, but there will be a point when, when we are there, when all of a sudden we gain speed and it's going to be very fast. We're not there yet, but this, I think, will happen. Um, thirdly, behavior change may precede attitude change. I think this is the most um, important thing I want to make. If, when we try to change people as a society, as a group, as an individual, we, we can mainly do two things. We can uh, try to um, change their attitude and we can try to change their behavior. In the end, it's the behavior that counts. I mean, you can have the attitude like, I, I think it's wrong to eat animals, but if you still eat animals, I mean, the animals haven't won, right? They're still being eaten, even if you be believe they shouldn't, right? The other way around, if you don't eat animals, but you believe they can be eaten, the animals have won. So this is actually, in, in, in a way, this is more important. What we m usually do, <laughs> is uh, as, as movements, as, as people who try to change the world, is, um, is this. We think if we change people's attitude, then their behavior will change, right? This is sometimes true, but often it's not true. But what we mostly uh, forget is the other way around. 
That behavior also influences attitude. Have you ever thought of that? That behavior yeah. influences attitude? I, I give you an example here. These are two people killing the same animals. The one is a toreador, um, and the other one is a butcher. So if I ask you, like, who would normal people in the street feel the most anger with? You also, you all say, of course, the Toreador, yes. right? Yes. And there's different reasons for this, but one of the reasons, and I think the main reason is, why? Because we think that it's not necessary, or oh, normal people think that it's... Yeah, that's one of the reasons, but I don't think it's the main, it's the reason I want to I want to get to here. Yeah. Yes, we think it has nothing to do with this. It, yeah, it is because most people are not into bullfighting. They're not support. They, they're not. They're not going there. They're not invested in it in, in Spain more than than, than here. The but they're not participating in it. Here they're all participating. So what you see here is your behavior influences your attitude. You're eating meat, so you think eating meat is okay, and you're not participating in bullfighting, so you think bullfighting is bad. But basically, there's there's two, there's two things, same thing, same things, right? So the what I'm thinking is the more people eat vegan, the more they will start to care about animals. Right, and so you could you could have like you could have people eating for all kinds of people eating vegan for all kinds of reasons, not particularly for eating animals, for for because they care about animals. For instance, I I, I know a story of a, a guy who went to India, and uh, in India there was like uh, he he thought the meat was nasty. It's like hanging around uh, without uh, not being refrigerated, etc. And there was so much so much good vegetarian food available in India. So he ate. Uh, vegetarian food and ended the whole time he was there without thinking of the animals. But when he got back, what happened was that his mind was much more open to listen to these arguments of animal rights people, right? Because he knows he had, did, he knew he didn't, he didn't felt he he had anything to lose anymore. He already knew that he could eat well without eating meat. So all of a sudden, it's like I compare it. You can think of examples for yourself. But for instance, what I don't like is this. Um, I love my smartphone. Um, and uh, what I don't like is these uh, these uh, messages about uh, the the potential damage that it may cause the, the 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 radiation, right? I don't I don't know if it's true, but I just don't read those articles. I don't want to know it's true because then I, I have to stop using my cell phone, right? But as as soon as I know that there's a cell phone that's like radiation free or whatever, and I have it, then of course I can I can listen to all, even I, I want to hear it because I can say like uh, uh, all these people uh, radiation and I feel radiation, you know. Um, so you understand? It's uh, it's when you have the alternatives when you know the alternatives are there that you all of a sudden like it, it's for instance um, you could see it like this um, yeah a meat eater uh, he sees like uh, this you know these people. Uh, who say like about an animal rights video? I can't watch this because if I watch it, I will go vegetarian. You know, I don't. I, I don't want to watch it because I will. I know I will. Will need to change, and I don't want to change. So it, it's that's that's what's what's going on. So if we can make them taste first, make them give give them the feeling that there's nothing to lose, then they they will be much more open to the arguments, right? So this is the reverse of like influencing attitude and then behavior. It's changing the behavior first through all kinds of means, means I will talk about, and then the attitude follows, right? So we don't have to despair when people like, they, they, they go and they, they become a vegan for, for health reasons. The rest will follow, you have to have some trust in that, okay? I'll talk about that later. Um, some important data, as Sebastian uh, pointed out, farmed animals is where the majority of the suffering is, much more so than um, um, whatever, uh, all the animals and entertainment, etc. And actually meat reducers, this is very important, are the main contributors to the reduction of animal suffering in terms of um, growth and in numbers, you know? Sometimes we laugh at meat reducers and we think they're not consistent, etc. but they are the reason that the market is there for us. They're the reason that we can eat a lot of, maybe not in some more advanced countries or countries like Germany where the market is bigger, but like in countries like, for instance, like, like Belgium and probably in, in countries like Italy and Spain and France, etc., the, 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 uh, all these products in, in organic stores, etc., they don't exist for the vegans. The vegans are just like 1.2% of the market. In France, 1.002% of the market. So, uh, um, they're, they're, they're there for the people like who are eating vegan now and then. So we have to, we have to think of that. Um, and the motivations of 
if you look at the motivations of vegans, it's mostly animal rights. But if you look at the mot motivations of meat reducers, it's health and taste first, taste variation. It's, 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 it's not so much ethics as the other reasons, right? So that means we have to keep it into account when we, when we do our outreach and when we, when we make stuff for them. Uh, and thirdly, going vegan is not easy. We may think like, la la la, it's, it's so easy today to be a vegetarian or to be a vegan. It's not really, I think. How many people change like from one thing to the other? Like vegan, omnivore vegan? Yeah, just a, a couple. Uh, I needed 10 years, about 12 years to go from meat eater to vegan. I love meat. Right? I was one of the people in the first day who, like, when they said, like, uh, the big wind uh, blows for all the ones who like the taste of meat, the big wind blew for me. <laughs> um, so um, these are the three ends of, of justification that, uh, that Melanie uh, mentions. Meat is normal, natural, and necessary. So these, make it, these three ends make it much more difficult to stop eating meat, right? Because we think it's normal, natural, and necessary. It does other things, of course. It's yummy. Right? And there's all these things, other, other stuff to worry about. I mean, we cannot, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's very easy for us to say, like, why don't you care? Why don't you stop eating meat? And, but people have so many things on their mind. And they, they, for most people, it's not just stopping from, from day one to day two, yeah. overnight. You know? It's much more complicated than that. So this is not uh, true, I think. Going vegan is not, not that easy. Um, sorry. <laughs> for most people, it looks like this, right? Vegan is like, how on earth, uh, what do you eat, how, how, how do you get there, how, this is like impossible, you know, it, it's getting easier and easier, but still, for me this was, this was like this at the time, I loved uh, eating animals, <laughs> yeah, I loved eating animals, I loved eating meat, uh, and, and I knew there was, I knew I had to stop eating them because I loved them, I loved meat and I loved animals. Uh, and I took, it took me 10 years to put it into practice. So I'm, in a sense, I'm happy to have had that experience because I understand how difficult it can be to people. If you, if you didn't have that experience, if you change from, from today to tomorrow, then you don't know how, it, how it, difficult it can be. Yeah? I'm just from my life this moment. What, what was uh, your thought as you um, started to change? I mean, uh, what, what was your upgrade like? Well, yeah, it, like a lot of people, I think it was like, oh, I could do it, but I cannot imagine having, never having the steak, steak au poivre anymore, or, or this cheese or whatever. And that's why I'll, I'll talk about, well, I talk about that later. Uh, yeah, that's the fear. Like, I loved it and I didn't want to lose it, right? And, and... The social aspect or the taste? No, the taste, especially the taste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And socially, like, I started, like, Stop it. I stopped eating meat first and I, I continued with fish for social reasons like it was not at that time 15 20 years ago It was not so easy as it is now And so I eat fish for social reasons like when there was nothing else and then I remember like sitting uh, uh, in front of a, a, a plate and there was like uh, langoustines uh, mm -hmm. These sh big shrimp and they have they seem to have these little eyes like like these li little black mm -hmm. dots and I promised right there and down to them, like, I'm going to stop very soon. <laughs> to the and I stopped. Uh, okay, so the strategy I want to explain to you is built on these principles that I just explained. Let's, let's take some, a lesson from another movement. There's a movement that looks like this. There's, um, this is the whole society, the whole, the big circle. And um, in, the, in the, the, the smaller circle is, the, those are people who like are not kind of real. And there's a, a, a small group of genuine people who are really, um, for whom it's really a matter of life and death that they stick to their principles. And the, the bigger circle is people who are like a bit more relaxed and soft. Okay, could you imagine what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about the vegan movement. So a movement or a group of people, there's a small group for whom they have to be very strict, and there's a larger group. Religious people, yeah, religious. Yeah, could you say you could say religious people, but more in terms of food. I'll show you. It's it's too difficult to think about it yourself, but there's the gluten-free movement, uh -huh. right? Is it a movement? 
Well, you, you no, know, it's it's not a movement, but it's like wow. it's it's just a movement. I'm just using it as a, as a but the, the, the gluten free or whatever you call it, right? Um, so there's there's this person, and she says like I I actually found this on I, I mean I found a, a person giving these arguments on Facebook. She said like all these people like like I'm she said like I'm really gluten free. For me, it's like really I mean you know people with celiac disease they cannot have even a gram of gluten, right? Mm -hmm. And she said like. Uh, I have this, uh, but there's all these people like who who like think that they are gluten intolerant. You know, there's a big movement, especially movement or whatever, in, this, in the United States. And she said like these people make it very difficult for us in a restaurant to explain that for me I cannot have any gluten because there's all these people in a restaurant that say like oh I'm gluten free, but but you know if the if the way to give them something they don't really care, they're very relaxed. And so, but these people who are very strict, they have to explain it. No gluten at all, please, right? But she says, on the other hand, thanks to these people, there's a much bigger choice in products right now. Okay? So she wasn't, this person wasn't able a couple of years ago before this whole thing took off with the, with the fake gluten fears. And before this whole thing took off, she wasn't able to find all these products. Now, thanks to all these fakers, she's able to um, have a big choice you know you should see in the u.s there's like huge shelves of uh, gluten-free products and like this in every restaurant you have gluten-free gluten-free options on the menu right um, so um this is the this is the advantage of uh, a big group of people that is not so strict can you see that um so there's the genuines who are strict there's a matter of life and death it's a small group and it's very black and white for them the other one is more relaxed. They avoid stuff like meat to some degree. They're a much bigger group and there's gray areas. Can you see the, the parallel with the vegan or the vegetarian movement? So if you look at our movement, so we have the strict vegans for whom it's a matter of life and death. That's us or most of us or part of us. And then there's like the, 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 the a bit more loose figures. Maybe it's strange to you that I make a difference between, between those, but there's, it's, a, it's a matter of degree, right? Um, and then there's the vegetarians, and then there's the meat reducers. But you see, these, this, um, this part of the population is a lot bigger than, than, than the other ones. And it's them who are creating the demand, right? Um, so there's two dimensions on which we ideally want to see people move. Um, two dimensions, two axes. We want to, to see people move in terms of frequency from, from their vegetarian meals. From, we want to see them move all the way to veganism, right? So that if you have like completely omnivorous there, they eat meat every day, then you have like a meatless Monday, then it's what you could call a demitarian, like a half vegetarian, you know, a vegetarian, <laughs> um, a veganish diet, like almost vegan and vegan. Like ideally they're there, right? Okay? And there's another dimension on which we want people to move, and that's in terms of motivation. We want ideally, I mean, I just saw that everybody's here or almost everybody's here for animal rights reasons. Ideally, we want, to we want them to be vegetarian vegan for the right reasons, right? We want them to do it for animals. We want them to care about animals. We don't want them to do it for no, for no reason at all or for health or whatever. So we want them to like, be as high as possible in that direction. And all the rest, you know, um, let me see. Yeah, all the rest we don't, these are like lightning bolts that it's like symbolic for what we don't like. Um, and so it's, it's, I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about this group, but you have, if you're not like this, if you, if you have a high tolerance for meat reducers and for um, people who are not vegetarian for the animals or vegan for the animals or not entirely vegan, if you, if you are more pragmatic in that, you can think of like, I'm sure you have met people who are like very, very much against meat reducing the meat reducing message and the, like the, uh, the not so animal rights message, etc. And you can use these arguments if they don't apply to you. You can use them for other people. So everything that is not entirely um, vegan for the right reasons is, is not good. Like the, the, we complain about the health vegans, like they're 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 like concerned about themselves. We complain about the meatless Monday people. We don't like people to make exceptions on their veganism. I mean a part of our population does. We certainly don't want them to be vegetarian because they're all hypocrites, right? They eat meat, but they don't, they, they, they don't eat meat, but they eat uh, dairy and eggs, so how can they do that? Um, and the demitarians, uh, or, or the ones like the meat reducers, of course, it's also not, not good enough. So the only thing that's good enough is um, <laughs> vegan for the animals. That's how a big part of our movement is. Do you recognize that? Okay. Um, are there people who think, like, think this themselves? It's not a, 
not a problem if you think. Yeah, okay. yeah but so, I don't say that. Huh? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to explain why it's not that important. So, um, and also why it's, why it's not that beneficial to focus only on that. So, if you, so what we want people to do is to be vegan and to believe that animals are not there for our use. I think, I mean, I want that too, but I don't want it like I'm not needed right away. I think we will end there. We will end up there. Okay? But look at, um, look again at this, at this graphic. Look at the people that are here, the vegans for the animals. That's just a few people, right? And, and all the vegans together, very few people. These are people. They're so small you can't see. Uh, this is, uh, th these are more people. The veganish people, the vegetarian people, the, the, the meat reducers, and then the, the, the people who are like eating meat uh, once, once a week, for instance, right? <laughs> and, and you can see the reason. So I think like, like if you look at people who like, Eating meat, eating vegetarian once a week or twice a week or something for health reasons and for variation, that's a very big group, right? So it's important to, to keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, more or less. Yeah, I, I mean, this is. I mean, I, I didn't proportionally like uh, space them out or something, but yeah, it definitely. Um, yeah, we know that. I mean, from our research in Belgium, and I think it's, it's similar. Um, we know, for instance, that uh, one out of two people wants to eat less meat, has the intention of eating less meat, right? Uh, <clears throat> and about twenty percent is, uh, or thirty percent, I forget, is like, uh, is is. Uh, having one or more days a week vegetarian okay and vegan was in our case was 0.5 percent okay um so what happened in the case of gluten-free a demand by a big group of people of fakers created a big choice so i think this is the best strategy for uh for vegan also create demand by a big group of non-vegans because if you want to create a big group of vegans that's going to take very long at this point vegan to make people vegan, it's it's hard still, right? It's hard because not because it's not supported by society enough still. Okay, so but if we can have like a big group of non-vegans, the supply will follow. And if the supply follows, if 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 we get more and more choice, if we get more and more choices, become stricter, becoming stricter becomes easier. You understand that? So if everywhere around you there's vegan options in restaurants, in shops, etc., if they're everywhere, then there's less and less. Uh, reason to make excuses, okay? And um, as people experiment, and this is also very important, if when as as, as they experiment with eating uh, vegetarian dishes just once a week or just here and there, and they experience that it's good, that it's tasty, that it's doable, that it's affordable, that it's nutritious, then their defense goes down, the defense against vegetarianism, and their compassion can grow. You understand? So that's what I mean with facilitating compassion. Compassion at this moment um, costs too much. Compassion is expensive. Does that make sense? If you, are, if you want to be compassionate, you have to give up your meat and dairy. And that's expensive. That's a, a high price to pay for a lot of people. It was for me. Right? It's not for everybody, but for most people it is. Yeah. For me it was not because of social pressure. Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing, I mean, taste or social pressure or whatever. So if we can make sure that thanks to these meat reducers and thanks to a rising demand, this, these, these, um, the vegetarian, you are as a, as, a, as a person who wants to eat less or no meat or, or wants to try that, you, you meet it everywhere, you are being met in your needs. You, by social, I mean, when you go somewhere at, at a, to a function or to like a, a dinner party or whatever, and there's vegetarian food there, there will be less, there will be less pressure. It will become easier, and it will be easier for your heart to open, right? Uh, <clears throat> so I think in the end that in that way we will end up right there with people vegan for the right reasons. But it's like indirectly, right? It's to an other approach. Um, okay, so compassion at this moment costs too much. So what I think is that there's two big phases in the movement. There's a, a, a phase right now in which we facilitate compassion. And there's another phase, a growing phase, where this compassion is a lot easier and where we can be more to the point, right? Um, so in this facilitating compassion, phase we're going to like ensure that there's a fertile breeding ground you understand a fertile breeding ground like uh, like if you if you if you um, sow the seeds of something you have to make sure that the ground is fertile right that is uh, receptive 
um, okay so what we want to do is like make a fertile prepare the ground for the future for the second phase okay and in the second phase we're going to like see the number of uh, vegans grow so I, I just explained these two phases a bit um, the situation today is phase one and I'm not sure how long it's going to take but let's see um, so public support is small it's still small for veganism it's small do you agree um, in general vegetarian or vegan is not the norm it's seen as above and beyond the call of duty you understand the expression like it's 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 like it's not my duty if you do it it's nice but it's it's not not something you have to do it's above and beyond the call of duty like it's it's like um, when um, when you risk your own life to save somebody you cannot expect it of somebody but it's nice if you do it that's what above and beyond the call of duty means you don't have to do it but it's nice to do it there's a very large economic dependency on using animals right this makes it very difficult to move there's a lot of um, a lot of enterprises that will lobby against us and like Sebastian said if there's more and more um, more and more uh, enterprise businesses that start to sell or they start to invest in selling vegetarian products their resistance to our cause will diminish that's very important so that's why we should support businesses who um, develop vegetarian products even if they own slaughterhouses and whatever it's the only way that they will stop resisting us if you are a soy milk maker and you have if you are a, a dairy company and you buy a soy milk company also you know and you have both then you don't really care if if if, if more and more sales are coming from selling so more and more profits are coming from selling soy milk you don't care right and you don't care if your share of dairy products gets smaller and smaller because you have you're just winning anyway right you're betting on two horses okay and the right horse has to win um, and we are still in the defensive position. So that's the description of phase one. So what we should do, I think, or what part of our movement, I'm not saying everybody should do this, but I th what part of our movement should focus on in phase one is, um, first of all, the arguments that we use, we should make them adaptive. We should like not focus on animal rights all, all the time. I hope it's clear now why. And we have to like, use the arguments enough to. So what we're doing, um, what we can do is like, yeah, shift our arguments like and see where we have to, where we can use them. And it doesn't matter for what people, people are going to like cross the threshold towards trying vegan. It doesn't matter why they're doing it. We, we will see them end up there with compassion anyway, like I said. Okay, so but most of our, uh, mostly our movement does this. We, 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 we put most of our efforts in the animal arguments, right? The movement as a whole. I'm, I'm sure as an animal rights organization, it's normal that you put most of your efforts into animal rights arguments. But as a movement as a whole, we should have different things. So we might consider like, like making this uh, smaller for some groups or organizations and, and, and focus on this, like health organizations, etc. I'm going to skip this one. Um, the call for action, what we ask people to do, doesn't have to be vegan, right? It can be reduction. So our main campaign is uh, Thursday Veggie Day campaign. We ask people to reduce, and that's with a very intentional strategy. You know, that's the strategy I just explained. If we get more and more people to do that, the choice for people will grow. It will become easier for people to be uh, vegetarian and vegan, right? And um, sometimes you can derive the efficiency of your actions um, by the um, or from the reaction of the opposition. How your enemies react to what you're doing tells something uh, of your um, of your efficiency. Like in the U.S., there's HSUS, you know, the, the organization, Humane Society of the United States. It gets a lot of criticism from the radical fringe of our movement, but it is the uh, organization that the industry, that the meat industry in the United States, that it is the industry that the um, uh, or the group that uh, the meat industry in the United States tries to like uh, destroy. Right, <coughs> so they know that that being moderate is, is is much more dangerous than being radical. Remember that being moderate is much more dangerous for them than being radical. If you're a radical, if you're like a crazy person, like like uh, like shouting, in, I mean shouting in the street, like let's just take it extreme, like like let's take a really crazy vegan, literally, like and he's shouting everywhere and blah blah. blah. Nobody takes him seriously, right? But it's like, if you have like a moderate person, like something like Peter Singer, he's not a real, he's not entirely vegan, but he's much more dangerous to the meat industry because he's like so 
so rational and he can convince people and the crazy people are not going to convince anyone. Okay? But, um, but uh, <coughs> the is, yeah. you can have radical people like uh, Gandhi or Martin Luther King. He was called extreme but in his time, but he yeah. was also very respected and yeah. had a lot of influence. Well, first of all, it's, it's a matter of time and I think the, the thing that I, I'm calling crazy now, a bit disrespectfully, we will be able to do in some time. And secondly, remember my, my, my remark about um, uh, comparing with other, there we had people fighting for themselves, it's not the same as animals not being able to fight for themselves. Plus, it's also the time in the history of one movie. So, there's some differences. Can I just yeah. say something? You can be really radical in your ideology, but you yeah. don't necessarily have to be radical in your forms. I think this is a, what makes a difference. Mm -hmm. We all are really radical in our ideas, but we have to carry our ideas in a modern yeah. way. I think that's a very important point. Uh, distinguish between, if you if you talk about rat being radical, distinguish between your aims and your way of communication. The way of communication, the, the, your aim can be as radical as you want, but communicate about it, communicate about it in a good way. But the two okay. examples I gave, they were both radical in their visions and their methods. And it worked. Yeah. But there were about people, there were like, uh, I mean, in India, Gandhi had the whole Indian population with him, you know. Uh, it's just the Brits that they had to take care of. Uh, so I think it's kind of a different different situation. But I mean, I'm sure that being radical can be can be useful at some point. But let's, let's just say it, let's just change it to like being being unconvincing and crazy, <laughs> I mean, at, at the very least. That, yeah. That's the thing that uh, maybe some vegans are using radical violence by the speaking violence mm -hmm. and, you know, in the acts. And, and Gandhi, for example, was totally non-violent. So yeah. I think this is this gained the respect of the government, you know? Yeah. Whereas if you are acting with illegal violence, yeah. no one's going to take you mm -hmm. seriously. Yeah. And I think the, the, the main thing was there that like Gandhi was coming up for a human cause, which was, I mean, human rights were already to some extent taken seriously, and, and now animal rights are still not taken seriously. Yeah. But like Nidhi pointed out, um, that it's important that everybody sees we are motivated by compassion. And I think the difference between the person you described like Gandhi and Martin Luther King is everybody knew Gandhi is motivated by compassion. But the crazy guys shouting uh, in the street, you don't you, you only see hatred. And yeah. Gandhi you saw let's let's assume they're also motivated by compassion but but what we see is is also a lot of hatred indeed but there, there's probably compassion in there too uh, hopefully um, but yeah and and people it's also very important not to give people an excuse not to listen to us right they're very ready very ready very very ready to ignore our message and to shove it aside we shouldn't give them any extra reason to do that and that's why we should try to be calm and rational I think Okay, what to do in the first, in this first phase, there's just uh, some points. Um, so, yeah, call, call, adapt your call for action. So, so a very important thing is like to, to distinguish between the number of vegans and the number of vegan meals, right? What's important is this, this, this number of me vegan meals. Get it, uh, get it up there as high as possible. Jonathan Safran Four, you know him from Eating Animals. I, I interviewed him sometime and he said, um, like, do I think that 90% of the world can be vegan in 10 years? No. But do I think that 90% of the, of the me meals can be vegan in 10 years? Yes. It's the same effect for animals, right? So um, I'll talk about that later. Um, <clears throat> so the most important thing is getting people across the threshold, making them try it, making them try vegetarian. There's still a lot of these, all these kind of like these prejudices about vegetarian diets, right? And we have to, the, the, the most important thing is like, if, if you would ask me like, give me one parameter in which you could like measure success, I would say like, and I'm, I'm vaguely thinking about it, like let's try to establish an organization that has as its sole purpose giving as many people as possible a good vegetarian taste experience, right? As many people as possible make them taste a good vegan meal, just once. Can you imagine like if I discuss with you about you're a, a, a meat eater and I discuss animal rights with you, can you imagine the difference if I do it um, just like this? Or if I do it after a meal, after a good vegan meal, can you imagine the difference? Right? I mean, maybe he's tired from eating, but, but other than that, uh, other than that, you have you have the idea like, okay, this can be good, and I can listen to you now. Yeah? No, he's not going to listen entirely, but his heart, to a certain extent, will be opened because he's not afraid anymore that he won't have anything to eat. Okay. Um, so at this point, our movement is not very comparable to other issues, or at least be careful when you compare to other issues. 
right? It, don't like simplify and say like, oh, it's like slavery, it's like this and it's like that. Uh, it's mostly it's not that simple, right? Because of the reasons I already gave you. Um, institutional change is very important. Try to we should try to increase the supply. Entrepreneurism. Do you know? Do anybody of you know Hampton Creek? It's like the company in the, in California that is is making the apps X substitute. So they're they're not. They're not very explicit in, 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 in an animal rights message or anything, but they have succeeded in like getting big, big, very big companies like Compass Group, the biggest caterer in, in the world, to uh, incorporate their products, their vegan products, into their meals, which is, which is an incredible effect for animals, without mentioning animal rights hardly, right? So this is also an example of behavior first, okay? Um, compromise and cooperation. Compromise is like an ugly word, but uh, but like cooperation with businesses, like Sebastian said, I think we can we can make a lot of allies wherever we go. We shouldn't be afraid of of of, uh, of anything. I think of, there's there's very few people uh, or very few companies that I think we shouldn't or cannot be allies with. Uh, not even butchers, not even slaughterhouses. I think anything is discussable. Um, pragmatism instead of purity. The animals don't need our purity, they need our effectiveness. Okay, I'll talk about that later too. Inclusion rather than the vegan identity. This is like, the vegan identity is like, how shall I put this? Um, it's like, like I'm a vegan and I'm very proud of that. And I'm, I'm like, um, it's, it, it, it's, it has its good sides because it forms our movement, but it's also, you can imagine that it's also ex it is exclusive. It doesn't allow people in easily if you, if you build up this identity around it, right? So I think that can be damaging. Yeah? A bit louder? Sorry. Uh, regarding the vegan identity, what, what I saw is that um, uh, uh, a lot of people who are interested in veganism or in, in, in the vegetarian lifestyle, they, um, they, uh, have, they are afraid to change because they are not kind of uh, supported in their vegan identity. Like, yeah. Um, so they try to hide with the same but very often it's not always um people they um which are new vegans they say you know to to find their vegan identity too, because I mean, for me, it took uh, almost eight years to find my vegan identity mm -hmm. because yeah. I had no support from somebody else. Yeah, I think we can we can distinguish between what we do externally and internally, publicly and and privately among us, like with potlucks and and things like that. And I I think I think, like I said, it has both the goods and its bad sides. But for instance, one of the downsides of it is like you know this story about um, or what happens frequently, like like. This is also something John Tessefer Food told me. He said, like, I was there was a guy and he had been vegan for um, for ten years, and then all of a sudden uh, he wasn't vegan anymore. And and John Tessefer said, like, I asked him what happened, and this guy said, like, well, yeah, I was at the airport and there was nothing vegan to eat, and I ate something non-vegan, and since then he's not vegan anymore. You know, that's the consequence of like being so attached to your identity that once you break it just a tiny bit, it's all gone. You know, and, and that's something we should be very careful about. And that's that's also very important in the sense that, like, if 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 we meet people who like um, they say they're vegan, and uh, but then we hear that they um, they may like once a year or something on Christmas with a grandmother they eat like some dairy pudding or something. We shouldn't tell them, oh, so you're not vegan, you know, because that's that's like very alienating from veganism, and that's like what makes them what what make easily like make them slide back. I'm giving people the power, you know, to um, define for themselves, okay, I'm yeah. vegan, but uh, not, not my identity doesn't, I mean, veganism doesn't define my whole identity, mm -hmm. I still decide yes or no to, to, to the things, but yeah. um, still give the people kind of, you know, um, the support, the tools to, to be a vegan, yeah. and, and to say sometimes also in front of people who there is nothing vegan I can you, yeah. you make me a present, mm -hmm. so I, I, I will take it, but I'm still a for myself, giving people the power. Yeah, exactly, yeah, good point. Yeah. 
And I think that it's good to say we are vegan in general because we are just human, we're just human beings. Mm -hmm. Like animals are animals, just that's the way it is. Yeah. And we shouldn't say we are vegans, we should say we, we eat vegan mm -hmm. in the daily practice, for example. Or we live vegan in the yeah. daily practice. Yeah. But we should not say we are vegans. So yeah. we should more say what we are doing yeah. in daily practice, in my opinion. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's something what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to do is like to avoid the black and white thinking about it. It's like some people who say like, vegan is like being pregnant. You are it or you're not. Yeah. <laughs> right? I think it's bullshit. Um, it's not like that. It's like, let's allow people for, let's a, allow a certain flexibility in it. You know, like one of the things I do is I, I, I don't, I'm not picky about wine. Okay, um, so wine is not usually on the bottle, um, if it's vegan or not, if it's clarified with an with a animal ingredient. Um, so I, don't, I basically don't care and I drink it. I give the wine the benefit of the doubt. Uh, so, uh, so and, and if somebody's going to tell me, which, which happened, oh, so you're not a real vegan, that doesn't do any good. You know, that alienates me from them and alienates me from the vegan movement and from veganism. And it makes, almost, makes me always want to say, like, I don't want to be vegan. You know, which which a lot of people uh, on Facebook especially uh, make you want to say sometimes. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so purity uh, is uh, purity. Um, I think is is de <coughs> detrimental to it. Um, and yeah, vegan as a diet. You know this this idea of veganism is not a diet; it's a lifestyle. Like a lot of people reacting on Facebook, especially like when we call vegan a diet. I think we should make it more difficult than it is and if people want to call it a diet that's perfectly fine in my opinion if you want to call it a lifestyle if you if you think like if you go vegan then you also like have this whole vegan philosophy and you have to be against this and against that and you have to be your politics have to be i mean there's people saying like yeah a real vegan is not um is not um does not do this and does not go to a strip club and does not do, do that and uh, i mean it's like a whole kind of thing that they want to include in that and I mean, vegan, being vegan is already hard enough as it is. Let's, like, let's take it step by step and ideally we include all these causes and everything in that concept of veganism. But, but not right away, please. Not, not like all at once because people are never going to move a step if you ask them all at once. So phase two is the growing phase. Compassion then is easier. Uh, public support is bigger. It's easier to talk about animal rights. It's easier to make these comp uh, uh, comparisons. We will have, we'll be in, in an offensive position. And um, what we can do then is, is much in that phase, much more focus on animal rights. Then it will be possible in that phase when it's, when it's doable for everybody. And when there's no good, I mean, today we're saying that there's no excuse to, uh, not to be vegan, but of course there are excuses not to be vegan. I mean, in practice, maybe not in theory. Uh, but at that point, we will be able to say to people like, okay, then it will be like talking about racism, you know? Racism is like, is like not okay, period, right? With veganism, we can't talk about it like that, or with speciesism at this point. There's too much resistance, there's too much, there's not, it's too difficult still to do it, etc. So, so I, I'm, I'm in favor of like taking this very gradually. Um, more radical activism, like this is what I'm saying, like, um, what actions are good is very dependent on, uh, on the time of the, in the movement. Like, for instance, um, like destroying property, I'm not in favor of that, but I can imagine that there would be a time when, when it is okay. Like, we, I don't think we are blaming today people who like destroyed slave owner property, right? And this may very, very well happen for us, but I think that, I think Melanie had said something like this too. It's all in what, or Sebastian maybe, it's all in what the public accepts, you know? It's not smart to go against the public opinion most of the time. I mean, strategically, right? If you do, if you do stuff that 95% of the people, like burning in McDonald's, if 95% if of the people, 99% of the people are going to say this is wrong, then it's not very smart to do that, um, okay? even though history may prove you right later. But at that point, it's not very smart. Um, all right, so the time frame like this, I'm talking about these two phases, when, when the one will change into the other, I really don't, uh, don't know. It might be like 10 years or something, just to say something. Uh, but the important thing is you, have, you don't have to see it like as two entirely separate phases, but I think in phase one, the, 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 the phase one approach is the most important, and 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 the, the 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 more straight, more direct animal rights approach should be like 
maybe a smaller part. And in phase two, it's just a reverse, right? When everything is more ready, when there's more options, when there's more public support, then we can be much more explicit. And I'm not saying that the people who are very explicit now should not do that. But I'm saying as a movement, we should really think about that. Okay? And also, it's, it's important, like, you know, to know your audience. And, like, for instance, you can, you can take the second approach, like the very direct philosophical animal rights approach, the anti-species approach, and you can, you can very well use that against uh, or, or uh, with um, smart, rational thinking people who are like philosophy students or something like that. But like, I wouldn't use, uh, for instance, if you had this $5 million to advertise on TV, I would not say like, stop being a speciesist. You understand? <laughs> it's, not, it's not understood, there's no, no, no public support for it, etc. In this phase, you could say that. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Um, so some, uh, one, one argument against this whole idea would be like that it's immoral. I mean, that if meat-eating is so immoral that we should make it, make it clear. We should just be, be clear about that fuck strategy. You know, we should just say like, okay, but it's immoral. It's like Gary Franchione does. It's like, like um, meat-eating is immoral, so we have to stop it. You, you, so you can't do it, and if you do it, you're a monster. It's that simple, right? I think this is not a very productive, productive um, way of communicating with people. Um, and I think if something is immoral, then um, if we believe that something is immoral, the best thing we can, we can do is make sure that people listen to us, mm -hmm. right? That they listen to us. If, if, if there's nobody to hear us, we're not going to have any impact. So the value of your message is in how it is perceived and how it is received by people. Okay, if it's not received, there's no, there's, if there are no listeners, um, then you, your message is not worth much. Okay, so I end with uh, some example. Well, uh, the second to last part is some examples of that phase one work. So, for instance, vegetarian maps is like, oh, maps where you can eat vegetarian food. It's not like a map of vegan restaurants only, but maps where you can eat vegetarian food. It's facilitating it for people. It's like showing to people, not just vegans, where they can eat that if they choose so. Okay, vegetarian cookbooks. Um, the, 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 the emphasis on food is extremely important. Okay, the, this is like behavior first approach. Food may show that people taste food a lot. And that's, that's a very strong point of our movement, that we have food as an ally, that we can use food in, in all our outreach. I mean, if you're talking, if you have a, uh, um, an organization against uh, sexual abuse or whatever, I mean, you can, you can use food, but it's not, it's not related to the core of your message, right? In our case, it is. So that's very interesting. We should use that. Um, so this is like a... Um, uh, yeah, cooking lessons. This, this is a campaign called Cook It Forward, where we said like you can have a free cooking lesson if you cook it forward to four to three other people. Um, yeah. uh, we talked about uh, butchers being allies. So we had like one butcher where just on one Thursday we, we convinced them to change like a part <coughs> of his uh, of his counter um, into a completely uh, vegetarian vegan uh, vegan thing. And so we invited the press, and this is like an official from the town. And this is a this was a famous actress who is a vegetarian in real life, but she is famous for playing the role of a butcher woman in a, in a TV series. So she was really the ideal person to, to put there, to sell, uh, sell meat, to sell vegetarian products there. So, <clears throat> um, and this, I think, this is very much also a, a behavior first, uh, phase one option, changing the default option. It's, it's like one of, the, one of the nicest things I, th I think, and, and I, we should give more attention to it. You know changing the default option, you know what the default option is? The default option is the option you're going to do uh, by default. If, 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 if nothing messes with you, if you, it's like when you subscribe to a newsletter, there's this, or when you like enter a web form, and then they, in the bottom there say like, I, yes, I want to dis subscribe to your newsletter. <coughs> By default, this little checkbox can be on or off. If it's on, you will get a lot more subscribers than when it's off by default. Yes? Another example would be in planes. You yeah. usually get the meal, meat meal, and if you make fun. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah, so in planes, I imagine you get on a plane and um, instead of like the, the, the person coming around with chicken or fish, you just get a vegetarian dish. And if you ask it before, only if you ask it beforehand, you, ask, you get a meat dish, you know? Now it's the reverse. If you're vegan, you have to like enter that beforehand on the website, but just reverse it. It's good for the plane, it's good for, it's good for everything. And the, the, the great thing about it is that people cannot really complain that their choice is taken away because they still have the choice. 
Okay, so this is what I what we did with our campaign in um, in uh, in the schools in, in our city in Ghent. So Red Riding Hood is saying thank God it's Thursday because she's not afraid of the of the wolf on, on Thursday. The wolf is eating vegetarian on Thursday. Um, uh, so what we did is it, on Thursday in the schools the, the 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 hot meal is by default vegetarian. So 94% of the people eat vegetarian on Thursdays. Um, and if they want meat, I mean, there's some parents who, for some reason, want to ha want their kids to have meat every day, um, then uh, the parents have to fill in the form beforehand that on Thursday it has to be meat. Okay, so I, I think it's a, I see it's behavior first, and, and it's like it's like making them more familiar, making it easier to do the right to do the right behavior. Um, Train the trainers. So uh, this is um, this is um, a restaurant contest that we have. This is like called the Chef for the Future contest, mm -hmm. and um, I think reaching out to chefs is very important. And when we reach out to chefs, people who have some experience with them, like Olivia or, or other people, uh, probably you're not going to like emphasize the animal rights reason first. It's like it, it will be about health and about good food and about gastronomy and things. Um, but as soon as they as as they are experienced with that. And they and they they have a restaurant a restaurant themselves later and they put that on the menu. I mean, then the animals have won, right? Because a lot of people have more easily access to vegetarian vegan food, right? Even though animal rights were not involved in the beginning. Okay. Um, yeah, and then something just to, to give you an idea um, of, of this whole idea of that that it doesn't necessarily start with ethics. Um, so what may happen in the future? This is my my last. Apart, um, so what may happen in this order? It's not necessarily to happen like this, but it could be. It could happen like this. Meat becomes too expensive um, because of all these problems surrounding it. Meat becomes too risky with with this um, this, for instance, avian flu and etc. And it becomes redundant because there's all kind of like good other options like um, like uh, great uh, vegetarian food or artificial meat um, and uh, artificial leather etc. And then meat becomes immoral, right? You understand? Because because all of a sudden people like they, people are open to think about this, like and they say like, yeah, we don't need this, we don't need this food. We have all this other great food, and come to think of it, what are we doing to the animals? We would love it to be the other way around. We would like it to be that people think like, oh, we do all this shit to the animals, and okay, let's go vegan. But and for some people it happens. For us it happened like that, right? But. For most of us, also the other way, the, the, the fact that we had vegan food in our surroundings also was very important. And for most other people, it's, it's even much more important, right? So uh, I think meat may become uh, immoral after it's, it's gone for other reasons, okay? Um, and if you don't believe that meat will ever um, be gone, I'm always saying to people, like, think of the earth, this is like uh, 2000 or 2015, um, just think long enough in the future, 2,100, 2,200. We will be here for a long time if we don't self-destruct, right? And I cannot imagine that just take the year 3,000, you know, um, that we are still eating meat then. So you just, if you're not hopeful, just think, think long enough in the future. But um, Peter Singer, uh, who I heard the other day here in Berlin, he said, like, um, he believes that we could have a, a vegan world in 50 years. 50 years. It could be less, he said. But so I'm, I'm very much convinced that, um, that we will get it. It's just maybe not going to happen in the way we all assume and we would want it to be. Maybe the order may be a bit different.